Hey, welcome back for the third step. We're gonna do the brush work over top of our ink drawing. So there's a couple things with the brush, things I call eye magnets and breadcrumbs. And then we're gonna go back to the pen and do some hatching, some tone transitions from the solid darks. So to get started with this, there's one, new, one more new tool that I want to introduce, which is the brush pen. So this is the Pentel Pocket Brush. It's my favorite brush pen. It's waterproof, so it's perfect for what we need here. And what I like about these pens is the tip. It's not a rubber-tipped brush pen, like a, a, a plastic-tipped mar marker. There's actually little fibers in the tip of this brush, fiberglass like a real brush, like you would get in a synthetic watercolor brush. So it gives you the ability to get those thick and thin lines going from thin shapes or laying it on its side to get big, bulky brush shapes. So it's really like a real brush in a fountain pen. So that's what I love about these. So shadow shapes are the main thing here. We gave ourselves these clues in the body and in the hair particularly about those solid darks. So we're gonna gig our brush and we're gonna work for these big dark shapes. Just laying in strokes. And in a way, this is kind of a simulation of the process of painting. That's what I love about working with the brush pen is it gets you practicing in every single drawing the kind of work you're gonna do with your watercolor brush later on. So I love this system because you're sort of training yourself for the future. That same kind of brush handling uh, that will work with any sort of painting. So what I'm trying to do here is work into those shapes. And again, it's not tracing. You've got these guidelines and you're doing a new fresh drawing, but you're responding to the clues that you gave yourself. And I built that mass into the head very quickly because I knew where I wanted it to go with my little hints. So we have the darkest dark in there. And there's all those little cast shadows in the face that I drew into those little, with those little pen impressionist marks. Those are my guide, and I'm gonna to continue to reinforce those darks, just uh, agreeing with what I already have there. Taking the pen drawing, and I'm looking over at my reference. Uh, ideally, your target person hasn't left, and you're continuing to draw from real life. So I'm looking for ways to reinforce what I already had there. So like I said, uh, or I have been saying, if, if I had lost my person, I'd have just these clues. But if I do have my person, I always draw from life when I have the chance. So it starts to accumulate the greater weight. And this thing that I called eye magnets, the solid dark just sucks your eye in. It just draws you to these places of intensity. So you wanna, you wanna control that. It's important to say, what is the most important thing? Which is usually the person's head. And this is where I want the darks to gather. So hair is great for that. As a thing that's gonna be your biggest eye magnet. But it's all about those shadow shapes I put in before. So you're looking for opportunities. Uh, okay, this is that thing I call breadcrumbs. See those little dit, dit dit I did? And then there's a bit of a sense of a clavicle here, or the, the collarbone. This is the clavicle in here, a little bit under the chin. So again, just as I did before, I've got a form here, the V-neck of the shirt, but I don't want to overdo it. I want to indicate it, not, not blatantly draw it in. So these are these little marks that I call breadcrumbs. They guide the eye little trail for the eye to follow. So it's brushwork that follows along a form, like maybe around this edge. But not a continuous, not a sealed line. It's always that principle of open line is still there. And there, I like to call them staccato marks, that you're thinking a, a bit like music, a bit like there's a rhythm to it. But I'm putting them down in a natural flow. So there's a little bit of a progression of thick to thin in, in those marks, and they get larger to smaller sometimes. We have a big mark and they go down in size. So it, all of these passages where I have a shadow that I want to reinforce, I'm, I'm thinking about how the passage of the eye is going to move through that space. Because you're always going to be attracted to contrast, and you're always going to be attracted to detail. The human eye loves tiny little details. That tells the story for us. It's the information. So we want the areas of the most information is the face because the features are small and we're always attracted to people's faces. So you want to reinforce those things very subtly. Um, you know, but I'm not going to get in and put a big dark shadow on here because I'm, I'm again working for the color. Each step builds to the next one. So the darkest darks are 
in those eyebrows and under the eye sockets. But that's, that's getting to be enough in the head there. And you can see the organization as it draws you towards the hair, that eye magnet. Breadcrumbs and eye magnets. And in the, uh, sometimes I call the brush word calligraphy. This uh, brush, what I like about this fiber tip is it, it is a calligraphy brush. They are originally for uh, Asian pen work. So maybe that's where I got the term. It's those little floating shapes. And I want them to be uh, kind of above the form, dancing around on there. It gives you a sense of motion. So see how I'm working around, just like I was with open line. I'm kind of working around the shape so I can see that I'm getting a nice gradation of marks. That's my darkest cluster, so I might continue to come back and restate that. You always want to know where is your darkest dark, and there can only be one area of greatest focus. There's almost always the head. Uh, but we'll talk about this in the black dress. So there you go. That's the accenting with the brush pen. I think, uh, you know, you don't want to overdo it because you're preparing for the color to come. So I think I'll often get, like, that bit of the jaw there. I mean, she has this... I'll often get a shadow under the ear, but she has that tuft of hair, so that's taking care of that. There's a thing that I call contact shadows, or, well, I didn't invent this term. When uh, an object sits on a surface, there's always a darkest shadow where it touches. It tells you that the thing is grounded. There's the corner of the book. So I, I wouldn't connect those. That's that open line idea, but I have those two shadows that are the corners of the book, where her hand touches the page, where her fingers are touching the coffee cup. These are what they call contact shadows. They're little bits of information that says those two surfaces are touching, so that's useful. Uh, yeah, but that's, that's, that's the brushwork. And now I'll, I'll make transitions with, I'll go back down to this small pen for some of this hatching. Now, there are shadow shapes I've drawn here, like this bit in the arm here. That is like a little passage. How I've filled that shadow shape. And there's a little transition off of this dark here, probably. So I have this philosophy about the hatching, which is that I like parallel lines. You might have heard uh, the term cross hatching. I'm not a big fan of cross hatching. I kind of like the lines to uh, be subtle. I don't, when they cross, they start to look dirty to me. A little too dense, I think, is what it is. You want the mark to be like a light tone. I'm thinking of it almost like a wash like a watercolor wash. And I like to break the form sometimes. Almost a sense, I suppose, of motion lines. So I'm carrying her form out into the world. This is, this is with the pen, but I want it to look airy. I want it to look light. So there's going to be cast shadow under her hand here. So you don't have to, you don't have to stay inside the figure. Sometimes you're going to completely contradict that form. So that's why these lines are so slender. They're just an accent. And again, it's like painting, thinking about light and shadow rather than like drawing. And I like to look at these tones and almost squint down at them and see where's there a gap. So these marks are, if I'm squinting, I see where I can fill in this tone and make it a little smoother. So it's a little more like a cloud, just a cloud of marks. And by keeping all those lines in a, in a parallel direction, it's just personal taste. You know, there are other artists that love to crosshatch. But for me, what I'm doing is leaving myself, I'm giving a directional flow to the piece. And I'm leaving myself uh, an airiness that I'm going to later accent with color. So that's my, that's my philosophy of hatching, that it's a transition from those solid dark eye magnets out into the space around. Back to our second example, this black dress. So that's definitely going to be an area of black. But uh, I'm going to proceed as before with the brush pen. We'll get started with that thing about emphasizing the shapes that I've given myself before. Those clues like it's always going to be when it's top lit, some shadow inside the eye sockets. And when you're, when you're doing a lady, uh, often I find it's helpful to come back with the uh, the makeup, the uh, eyelashes, a little sense of what's in the mouth. These are these little, little kind of tick marks that just reinforce that shadow, the dancing breadcrumbs. That sounds like a Panera commercial. So shadow shape on the side of the hair here, emphasize that. But this is almost like creating an edge, because I wouldn't fill it with black, because her hair is actually quite light, this uh, 
uh, coppery color she has going there. So I'm not going to hit it. I'm not going to overdo it. Less is more. But what are the areas that will accent is where the shadow is cast? Inside the ear, there's that little loop that makes an ear. You don't have to get these perfect, just that there's some stuff going on there. OK, and the fingers have that cast shadow in between them, but it's weighted towards the bottom of the hand. So you have a sense of there's a knuckle there. There's that ring uh, weighted towards the bottom of the hand. There's the cup base. So this is that same process that I did in the first drawing. But I'm thinking already about what I'm going to do with this dress. Because there's a, a lot of solid dark going on here. So, and I want to I wanna just be bold and take that on. Let me build up to it. But I'm still thinking in terms of these, these marks that lead in a natural transition. So you remember I said before that the head is almost always going to be the area of the darkest darks. But because of that dress, and because I also said you can only have one focal point, that's the big, powerful silhouette. And it would overpower her features. So I'm not doing that in her hair, but I'm getting ready to do it here. These are just some guidelines for myself. And I want to. Get a sense of that weight in there. So when you put darks on the underside, that idea of the contact shape, it gives you the sense of the weight of an object, that it's resting on a surface, that there's some gravity. It pulls your eye down. So I've been doing that pretty reliably throughout these things, the undersides of forms. This is that finger that's touching the cup. And there's two fingers here. So that's that underside of everything. There's a little dark in the cleavage. And a, little, some, a few wrinkles in the fabric here, but that's just the interesting outside edge. I'm sort of, uh, I'm sort of avoiding what's going to be the big challenge here a little bit. Maybe I'm a little bit scared of this big silhouette. So let's get to that. that this is just build up, giving myself some clues. So now when I'm going to do this, I'm going to switch to a real brush because it's a large area. You could do this with the brush pen, absolutely could, especially if you're working in a smaller uh, sketchbook. But I want to be really bold with it, so I'm going to switch up to a real brush. This is a Da Vinci Kalinsky Sable. Uh, I love these brushes. But uh, synthetic is fine. They're certainly uh, natural hair brushes are uh, a little bit more expensive, but they give you a nice point. But synthetic is absolutely fine. I use those for many years. So here, what you want to do when you're filling, this is really watercolor painting with ink. You're laying the brush on its side and pulling forms across, thinking about how the structure is underneath there. So it's almost the reverse of what I've been doing before. This is a big solid area. But I'm leaving some little whites behind, transitioning off these shapes. The little whites that I leave behind when I'm done and I've filled that silhouette, they're going to be uh, contour lines. They're going to they're gonna describe the shape. So I'm thinking about what am I leaving behind? It's almost as important as what I fill. So this is, a, this is a lot of ink. Big, powerful brush shape. I like to use the biggest brush that will fit in a space. Because you can do very fine work with the tip of this thing. Uh, I'll often, what is this? This is a number 10. I'll often use a number 10 for the entire piece, really. That's not unusual, especially in the field. Uh, when we get to watercolor, I'll show you my travel brushes. Um, when I'm traveling really light, I might only carry one brush. So that would be a number 10 size. You get to the point where you can do everything, but just the tips. So see how it's starting to mass in as a silhouette? But just like uh, with my, uh, just like I was doing with my pen and ink work. I never want it to be like, it's not like painting a wall. I'm not trying to fill it in flat. I'm trying to think ahead so that I have open line, living, organic shapes. So I can see the body appear inside the dress. These are like little visual clues. And I'm leaving holes in the drawing, just like I do with my open line, because I want the color to show through. Even in a black object, there would be color. I think what I'll do, though, is do some transition from here. So we'll go back to the hatching. So remember how I said I would often just break the form? I'd blend those big solid darks right out into space. And 
And I'm keeping with this idea of general parallel marks. It's just like a, that's like a watercolor wash. A light tone done with a not particularly light implement. The pen, the black ink is so strong, you need to think of ways to soften it. So that's what hatching is. This is a transition from solid dark. So it's not an abrupt edge. See how I'm just working that edge and it becomes a little softer, a little softer as I go. Inside this body, I talked about keeping the lines all in the same direction, but I'm going to do a little bit of work that follows the contours. See how this transition goes, it follows the direction of the fabric. I'll come back and just make sure it hits the hand there nicely. She has shadow under the, the shadow shapes under the jaw. A little bit of, uh, a little bit of shadow in there. So there's that space I said I wasn't going to fill in with ink, but I'll get the shadow side of the head there. And I love this pen for these little spidery marks it makes. They're very thin. So I, I, I don't often hatch with the, uh, the Lamy that I love for drawing because this is such a bolder line. But I might come back here, let's reinforce this edge, direction of the hip. There's actually a little more hip going on there. So you know, if you ink with the Lamy, hatch with the Lamy, it's a little bolder. Nothing wrong with that, but uh, normally I'd step down a pen for these fine details. Let's go back and catch a little bit more action in the face. So, uh, okay, so that was dealing with the solid darks. This is the transition. Um, you see it's a very similar process, but I had this, I have to think about uh, solving that. So I, I wouldn't have wanted to do it entirely with hatching because I want those solid darks to read like a silhouette. When I squint down it, I want to see her big shape. And when you're drawing in a sketchbook, uh, one drawing leads to another. So if you have multiple things on the page, these large areas, say I had my next drawing on the following page, you're going to go from person to person to person. So if there's one focus per object that really just helps organize space. Makes for good sketchbook layouts. So I don't want to overwork it because, of course, I still have one more sp st uh, stage, which is the color. But you could do this. You can, you can really get into this inking. If you like black and white, you could stay with this forever. You don't, I like watercolor, but that doesn't mean you have to do it. Everyone sketches differently. Some people really get into this hatching process and just keep doing it finer and finer and finer. That's great. Sometimes I like to bring out an old sketchbook and go back and do some hatching on a drawing that's in there. I call it my knitting, waiting for the subway. I like to take out a book and, and uh, do some details on a drawing. So hatching is something that you can do after you've lost your subject. I, I, would, I would not stop and do all these fine little pen marks while I'm capturing somebody in motion because I'm drawing too quickly. More likely, I'd start another drawing while the person is actually there and then come back and do this knitting afterwards. Refinement stage, that makes sense? So there we go. That's a combination of quite a bit more brushwork and graduating the tone out with these hatch marks. Okay, there's one more trick, and that's erasing. So after you've waited enough time for your drawing to dry, so you don't get any smudges, then you get to just go in with a kneaded eraser and lift out your pencil lines. And you don't actually have to scrub the eraser, it'll just pick it up. And this is the fun part. It's like a magic. You're taking away the evidence of your rough drawing. And that's why I was very casual with it, and I, I didn't even really try with that gesture because it's gone, it's disposable. All the evidence is removed and you're left with your open line. This is really, like I said, this is the fun part. It's like a magic trick. All those little gaps that you left in your line are now clean, white, open spaces. Looks great. That's why I start with, uh, in my homework, I say start with some of the gestures you don't like. Because you'll be able to uh, remove all evidence of your previous work and come down to the finish. So there you go. It's ready for color, which is the next lesson. So for homework on these. Uh, the next step for you is to do as I did and uh, bring out the brush pen. So we're taking our ink drawings and adding those focal points, working the brushwork to draw your eye to the areas of the darkest dark. And remember, one focus per sketch. So uh, I have some exercises to take the brush pen into the field. I think you should use it in your scribbler on location. Uh, just as I said, 
As long as you have a subject in front of you, keep rolling. Pen to brush right away. And uh, even there's an exercise in the class materials to try to do some silhouettes. Just brush marks, little tiny shapes, building people with only the brush. That will really tune up your hand skills. Uh, so for next lesson for us, we're going to be doing color. We'll use those brush painting tricks with the watercolor. And that's the fun stuff. And we'll come back to that. <laughs>